Um, so, uh, Cousin's going to hear, he's going to talk to us about some, uh, some work that he's doing on early universe stuff, uh, dark matter, inflation, and um, these things called dark stars, which I am very intrigued. Um, so, let's welcome Cousin. Well, I want to start by thanking everyone for being here. It's uh, wonderful for me to be giving this talk today. I'm very excited about it. And uh, I want to thank, in particular, the physics department for inviting me and giving me this opportunity. Now, let me tell you about uh, one of the research topics I have uh, studied, essentially the formation of first stars and how they, this uh, phenomenon can be affected by dark matter, if in any ways. So the outline of my talk is going to be the following. Introduction, then I'm going to tell you a little bit about the basic dark star picture, if there can be such a thing. Then a numerical model, which we use, describe it in a, little, a few slides. Then I'm going to move to the meat of my talk, which is supermassive dark stars. So going from a basic picture to objects that can grow to be about a million solar masses, the mechanisms that are behind this kind of uh, object. Then, a little bit of interlude on detection techniques for high redshift objects. Why? Because we believe those uh, dark stars form very early on. There are uh, redshifts at 10 to 15. So we need, in order to detect them, we need techniques for such uh, red high redshift objects. Apply them to supermassive dark stars and end with some conclusion. So in this slide, which you probably have seen a number of times before, it's a brief history of the universe in one picture, and you start from uh, from the far left, which is the Big Bang, end up with the far right here today. There's many knowns and many unknowns in this picture. We know that currently the universe undergoes a phase of accelerating expansion, more or less we're centered about this, so here, roughly here it started. We know that structures form hierarchically, meaning they start to merge from smaller structures to bigger and bigger structure. And you end up with this pattern, you can see here, a, a cosmic web. We also know that there was a period of uh, where the cosmic microwave background was generated, essentially recombination. After recombination, you have the first neutral atoms, so the universe becomes transparent to radiation, and this is observed today. From this CMB, you can put a lot of constraints on the parameters of your model for the universe. However, the topic of today's talk, to give you a sense of time scales, is the first stars and galaxy, which happens roughly 200 million after the Big Bang. It ends what's called the dark ages of the universe. So after CMB radiation is released, basically the universe is not radiating anything. So the first stars are going to end this period of dark ages. So in the basic picture of star formation, well, yeah, they are the first luminous objects, but how do they form? Well, you have this pristine molecular crowds, which are made of hydrogen and helium. And when the temperature of the universe <laughs> is cool enough because of expansion, this cloud can start collapsing and be self-gravitating. Right? Once this happens, um, there's going to be a competition between heating and cooling mechanisms. And since you have a very low metallicity in so those environments, the cooling mechanisms are very poor. The main uh, would be molecular hydrogen cooling. So at some point, this cloud is going to collapse enough such that at the core, you have a high enough temperature to ignite nuclear reactions. That's the standard picture. When this happens, soon there's going to be a com an object relatively compact, which is radiation supported uh, by a nuclear reaction, and that's a pop three star. So um, the question you wanna, we want to ask, if first stars form in a high dark matter density environment, which we believe it is the case because it's high redshift, so dark matter, at least the average dark matter, scales like redshift to power cubed, so it should be higher back in the universe, <coughs> would you be able to uh, see any impact or any effect on star formation from uh, dark matter? It could provide an additional heat source. Why? Now, dark matter could be, in principle, its own antiparticle. We don't know that with certainty, but certain models allow for this to happen. And if it is the case that dark matter is its own antiparticle, it could collide with each other, 
and then annihilate and generate a heat source. If this heat is trapped inside of your <coughs> core, then you have another uh, mechanism to prevent further collapse. And it can happen before the um, nuclear reaction ignites. So let me tell you a little bit about this plot. Well, can I ask you one thing? Uh, yes, just yes. Say. So could you say a little bit more, why is the density of dark matter thought to be uh, more? How, why is it thought well, to go, yeah, what, why, do you, why does going back in time prefer dark matter over luminous matter? as the background density, right? Like, you know, background density dilutes with expansion. It is true but, uh, that you actually don't n look at the background density, but you look at over density, right? So that's a completely different question. However, still, it, so from, from background density, they're higher when you go back in time because of dilution with expansion. And uh, also another reason why they, they form at high redshift be is because you have to have a very poor, poor, um, cooling mechanism. W whenever metal starts to enter the, the, the game, then all of this doesn't work anymore because you have such a strong cooling, efficient cooling mechanism. Anyhow, in the case of only molecular hydrogen cooling, those are here in red, the critical temperature lines. Right? So basically at the critical line, you have equal heating versus cooling. Below this, any of those lines, heating dominates. Right? For Winds of mass is 1 GeV to 10 TeV. In blue, you have a, an evolutionary track of a typical protostar. So the general result is that they intersect. Almost independent of the mass, they will intersect. The more efficient the heating, the more efficient the heating means for lower GeV masses, they intersect earlier on. But the intersection then, what's happening is that you're going to have this new heat source, and the collapse is stopped, and you, you end up with an object that, that quickly thermalizes and enters hydrostatic equilibrium, this new object, powered now by dark matter emanations, we call it a dark star, or a proto-dark star. From this seed, it can continue to grow and accrete baryons and become much larger. So let's see a little bit about this property. When they are born, for instance, for 100 GeV, it's a very large object, 70 AU, with relatively uh, small mass, but the important thing is that they're huge. Uh, even if dark matter is only 2% of the entire content, it can power this object and it can shine very brightly, about 140 stellar luminosities. Now, how... Sorry. Yes? Can I, so, you're assuming that the dark, the, the dark matter is made of these particles that, up, that are their own antiparticles, yeah. and that they have these energies really high, like a couple hundreds of GPs. The masses. I mean, it ranges between, for instance, in this plot, 10 and 100 GeV. This is, and in that one before we, we go even, what, where is it? One before we go even lower, 1 GeV. So that's kind of like the range we expect. Okay. And so the next plot is, this is the statistic. Let's just say now I have a star yeah, now this powered is by this event. Right here. So right here, collapse. Okay. Yeah. At around. 10 to the 15 number density, baryon number density. In the standard picture, where you don't include this, the collapse ends around 10 to the 22. Order of magnitude later in, in number density. So they forming earlier now because of this new Yes, energy. yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, once you have this core for the proto-dark star, how can it grow? It cannot grow by accretion of baryons. And uh, dark matter can be supplied in different ways via adiabatic contraction. Basically, in order to, to have enough dark matter density for these annihilations to be efficient, you have to increase it from the uh, profiles that are assumed. Like uh, in the literature, you have an NF, so-called navarro frank white profile, which is pretty universal. We believe that dark matter halos obey this kind of profile for dark matter densities, right? So there's this R, and then you have here. In a log log space, this would be an NFW profile. Yeah. Or, you have a question or no? Mm -hmm. All right, I thought you did. <laughs> now, uh, if baryons accrete at the core, what's happening is that they increase the potential well. And <coughs> this means the orbits of dark matter are going to get closer and closer to, to the center. That means the density of dark matter at the center is increased. So, from this NFW, you're going to have an increase there because of the effect of baryons. So baryons are going to give you a higher density at the center just because they provide a higher potential well. 
This is called adiabatic contraction. Okay? In the standard picture, uh, whenever you run out of this dark matter supplied by adiabatic contraction, you end up with a massive object, about a thousand solar masses, a few astronomical units in size, very bright, but cool. That's important to remember. They are about uh, 10,000 Kelvin versus 100,000 Kelvin um, for pop three stars. Therefore, they would not be contributors to the reionization of the universe. And moreover, the accretion can continue because they are cool, so there's no strong feedback mechanism. Can I do that question? Yes, <coughs> yes. Um, so this luminosity, when it's radiated, it's not like a black body? Well, I'm going to actually show you yeah. some spectra. It, you can, in, in first round, you can assume it's like a black body, actually, because it's in thermal equilibrium, you can use the p to the fourth r squared law. We actually impose that in our code. But there's spectral pictures, and I'll show you some spectra in a bit. Now, there's another additional mechanism to provide the dark matter via capture, and that's very similar to direct detection experiments. The technique is to try to uh, measure uh, the recoil of nuclei. So whenever dark matter bumps into a nucleon, it slows down, so it transfers some of the energy to the nucleon. Same thing can happen in a dense uh, environment where you have a high density of baryons, in this, essentially in these dark stars, right? So it can trap some of the ambient dark matter from around. <coughs> and, uh, I'm not going to go into detail about this capture rate. I want you to remember only about the fact that it's proportional to number density of baryons, number density of dark matter, and this unknown here, which is the cross-section for collisions. This is the big unknown, right? In the minimal capture case, what we've done is to assume that when it enters the zero H main, main sequence, there's equal contribution in the luminosity in this plot from dark matter hitting a nuclear. As you can see, those two are absolutely equal when it enters the zero age main sequence. In order to achieve this, we have adjusted the average background density to this value. If you break this assumption, obviously, this plot is going to no longer be valid. So I'm going to show you later what's happening if you break <coughs> this minimal capture case. The properties are similar to main sequence stars once it's entered here. And let's go to see some other sources. Well, there's nuclear. You can see here a little bit of a deuterium bump. Then there's gravity. Whenever the dark matter behind it, uh, AC runs out, there's going to be a brief phase of gravitational collapse. The green line is gravity. Nuclear reaction ignites, as I said, and then later on, even capture becomes efficient. The masses for those objects are around seven to 800 solar masses. Now, uh, what do we have assumed? So you start with this proto-dark star, which, which reaches hydrostatic and thermal equilibrium, hydrostatic equilibrium here. Then you need to know something in order to compute the evolution. We assume something about the equation of state. Whoa, OK. That's not good. But about the equation of state, we assume the fact that it's a polytrope. So you can relate P with rho. And for that N, if N is 3, then you have radiation domination. It's fully radiative uh, energy transport. If N is 1.5, then what we have there is just Convection. So you start with a convective object. That, that core is purely convective. And later on, when the mass increases, you're going to be uh, having a, where do I find the plug here? In front of me. OK, I got it, I got it. I got it. Then later on, they're going to be uh, fully radiative energy transport. Energy, the pressure is two components. <laughs> Radiation, as I said, and some from the gas, which later on becomes negligible. And we define the surface of this object as optical depth 1, which corresponds to this equation right there. So what we do is to start with a guess for the radius of the object and adjust it in such a way that the total luminosity from all of the sources, dark matter, gravity, nuclear, and capture, is equal to the luminosity uh, of a black body. And now we adjust the radius in order to re reach this thermal equilibrium condition. The dark matter heating, as you see here, is dependent on mainly three parameters. The ratio between density square of dark matter and mass of dark matter, and the annihilation cross-section. Also, we, if uh, temperature becomes very hot, like uh, 10 to the 5 Kelvin, then accretion is turned off because of feedback effects. Otherwise, 
we start to invoke those effects at 50,000 Kelvin. Those are the surface temperatures. Yes, yes, surface temperatures. Now, how can we build <laughs> those objects to supermassive passes? So up to now, we have seen that they can be around 1,000 solar masses. Massive, but not massive enough to be detectable and anywhere near massive to be detectable. So if we break down the capture conditions, the minimal capture, remember it was set an ambient dark matter density of 10 to the 10, so that you reach the 0 H main sequence around 700 uh, solar masses. However, <coughs> as you can imagine, you can increase that ambient density because it's an unknown param parameter, and you're going to have a completely different evolution in this uh, eight, this kind of, uh, I guess, HR diagram, right? So in this space, the object contracts because dark matter <coughs> from adiabatic contraction runs out. So you have here adiabatic contraction, then that dark matter runs out. There's a contraction phase. Why? Because luminosity is constant, but still temperature increases. Um, and then you're going to, depending on how efficient the, the capture is or the heating from capture is, you're going to diverge from the main track that goes to the zero age main sequence. Diverge sooner if heating is more efficient. And heating is more efficient if you have higher background densities, right? So that makes sense. Now, uh, I have to tell you that the results depend on this product. So if you strengthen this, which is a bound, <coughs> you're going to have to uh, play back to the with the dark matter densities to get the same results. It's the product that matters. There's another kind of a scattering, the spin-independent scattering, for which the bounds are way more stringent. Or, and then in this case, uh, capture could contribute only if you have a very high uh, dark matter density, just because this is so much more. Now, there's another mechanism. So we're talking about adiabatic contraction, meaning you have orbits. Some of them can be circular. If you, if you think that the halo is uh, circular, then many orbits are going to be circular, right? And once they are depleted, then you run out of this dark matter from adiabatic contraction. You have what's called the loss cone. So as I have shown you in the previous picture, run out of AC, then either go to the main uh, zero age main sequence or mm -hmm. capture becomes relevant. However, dark matter halos are not spherical. They are in typically from simulations, we know that they're triaxial, triaxial. So their orbits are going to be a much more complicated things. And some of the orbits, such as box orbits or chaotic orbits, pass arbitrarily close to the center. Right? So that means, let's say you have dark matter ionization. And so you re just remove two dark matter particles from the pool. There's a relatively high likelihood that in the very next a moment of time, you're going to have one of those centrophilic orbits pass there and then replenish your, uh, your loss cone. Okay? So there's an additional mechanism for refilling the source, this uh, box or chaotic orbit, due to the triaxiality <laughs> of the dark matter halo. The question is what happens, how does this picture changes when you introduce a baryonic component at the center, which is the star. The star is formed of baryon. Well, the first thing that's happening is that now baryonic components of the center tend to restore the spherical symmetry. So instead of having a strong triaxiality, you're going to restore uh, an object which is nearly oblate. And as I told you, if, if the object is very spherical, then AC runs out quickly. So this is bad. However, even if you have this compact object, Valuri has shown that a significant fraction of orbits are still centrophilic. Right? Even if the halo itself becomes a little more spherical, there's still 10% of orbits centrophilic. And there's a, additionally a strong chaotic uh, scattering which drives orbits close to the center. Meaning those box orbits, instead of becoming uh, centrophobic, instead of just being tube orbits which avoid the center, they're just going to change their, their shape but, but still be box orbits that pass arbitrarily close to the center. So from this, we just say, all right, let's take the very simplistic assumption that we can extend adiabatic contraction, uh, uh, contraction 
indefinitely. So whenever you remove a dark matter particle from the pool because of annihilation, let's just assume there's an orbit passing nearby this centrophilic orbit, which replenishes it. That's what we call extended adiabatic contraction. Of course, this is a very simplified assumption. And what one should do is to do a numerical simulation and see how the orbits refill the loss cone. So that's an uh, extremely challenging task because of the resolution needed for numerical simulation. However, let's just see HR diagram in the case of extended adiabatic contraction for different wind masses ranging from 10 GeV to 1 TeV. And as you can see, those are the evolutionary tracks in HR diagram. Luminosity here, effective temperature there, as we have seen before. The more efficient the, um, the cooling, uh, the, s the higher the uh, luminosity <coughs> for the given temperature. As you can see, the black line is above, which is more efficient cooling. It has 10 GB compared to 1 dB, less efficient dark matter cooling. Now we just superimpose what we had before. This is when you don't consider extended adiabatic contraction, but rather you consider the capture, extended capture phase. So here, the ACE adiabatic contraction phase runs out dark matter. Then you have a purely con phase where a nuclear reaction <coughs> kicks, kick in. However, when the density of variance is high enough, you're going to start having this uh, sort of extended capture mechanism. One thing to keep in mind, as you notice, at high masses, luminosity scales like mass, right? So almost independent of the, the mechanism, if you have a high enough mass, luminosity scales like mass, which is indicative of the fact that the object has reached um, radiative transport. So when, right now it's in radiative transport. It, the details don't matter. And they are large, 10 AUs, and relatively cool. Now, as promised, a little bit of interlude of how we hope to detect those objects. They are formed in the universe redshifts at 15 to 20. Well, I don't know if I mentioned already what's redshift. I'm going to take this moment to tell you what redshift is. It's basically a way to quantify how far back we look in the universe. It's based on the fact that expansion of the universe essentially is going to redshift or expand wavelengths. With this, you can define a quantity called redshifts. Today, this Z number where redshift is zero, for instance, another important epoch would be star formations, which is around 20. And another one would be um, reionization, which is around 1,000, and so on and so forth. One technique is photometric dropout with Hubble nowadays, or lensing. So let me start on the right, lensing. If you have a very faint distant object, if it's gravitationally lensed by, by a very large cluster, such as in this case the Abel 383 cluster, you can hope to boost its signal to observable levels. And in this way, the most distant object has been observed and identified to have a look back time of 20.8 giga years, which is extremely impressive because the age of the universe is kind of close to that. So being able to observe something that close to the Big Bang with just lensing is really mind-boggling. Also, with photometric dropouts, I'm going to explain next slide what those are. In, in here, you have a, a slice of the Hubble ultra deep field in the infrared with, uh, with C3 camera. You, you can see some candidate objects for which the look back time is, again, very close to 13.7, which is the age of the universe. So let me explain to you what a dropout is, photometric dropout. Usually, you observe in different wavelength bands or with different filters. Those are called H, J, Y, and they are labeled based on their um, wavelength. So each of those filters is centered along, around the cent certain wavelength. Now, as you notice here, a uh, given uh, point, you have detection in H band, detection in J band, starting to get fainter in the Y band, and then it's completely dropping out in all of the bands afterwards. This phenomenon is called a dropout. And let, let me try to explain why a dropout happens. It all has to do with the fact that the universe was not reionized until redshift at 7. So what's reionization? Well, we learned about the fact that the neutral atoms form around redshift of the thousand. 
recombination neuron. So the universe is neutral back then. <coughs> neutral means opaque to radiation. Why? Because radiation can encounter it and can be absorbed, right? There's a specific wavelength which is very important, which is the Lyman alpha wavelength there, which is transition between one and two hydrogen levels. If redshifted Lyman alpha enters a certain band, then you're going to have the sec this trough here. The spectrum is completely uh, attenuated because you assume there's enough clouds of neutrals in between you and the source to completely absorb the spectrum here, right? Now, what you need to do to, to predict what you will see in a certain band is to convolve the response of your filter or the transition. And here you have several filters, F160, F110, and so on and so forth with the spectrum, the 10 meter spectrum. So as you can see, H is still fine because you can both uh, quantity is non-zero, but once you enter this region where the trough is, then there's a drop off. With there, this is a technique to actually determine uh, redshift of objects because you know, uh, depending on the band, where what the central wavelength is. So you know that the, the drop off happens when the redshift Lyman alpha enters that band. That's one way to estimate the redshift of your object. Uh, I'll briefly tell you, like, Hubble has an ultra-deep field which probes the first galaxies. And as you can see, because it's a deep field, it's a relatively narrow survey. So it probes deep in the universe, but the, angular, the angle, opening angle is pretty small, as you can see here. Now, in order to, and this comes back to a question we had before, is the spectrum a uh, black body or not? During the first approximation, it's not a black body. You're going to see spectral features. And in here, I have a dark supermassive, dark stars, 10 to the 6 or masses. Uh, velocity is just a code which generates synthetic stellar atmosphere, so it generates those spectral lines. In there, you have a 10 to the 6 with capture, so two different mechanisms. You're going to notice that with capture and extend they see the spectral features are different just because of the different temperature. Capture is a little bit hotter, not by much, but still hotter. 5.1 10 to the 4 versus 2 10 to the 4. And that's this temperature here uh, and this surface uh, density is enough to ionize most of the helium and hydrogen. So you won't have a strong Lyman break. You won't have a helium 1 absorption, but you will have a strong helium-2 absorption, just because of the higher temperatures. Now, uh, to detect, we need to compute some numbers. And uh, astronomers like apparent magnitudes. That's one thing to talk about. The apparent magnitude is basically a way to tell what the flux is in a certain band. So if you know the band, you know that the transmission of that band, which is the instrument is always going to publish this T of lambda. You take it from there. Then you have the flux, which we have on the previous plate page. You redshift it here, and then compute this apparent AB magnitude in different filters in such a way. Once you have it, we're going to invoke a dropout criterion. In order to have detection, as I showed you before, you have to have dropout. And dropout criterion is whenever the difference between the magnitudes in, in this case, J and H band is 1.2. Then you're going to claim the detection of an object via a photometric dropout that redshifts the rough roughly 10. Let's see, can they be detected in Hubble, the dark stars? Well, in, in here, what I have is the apparent magnitude in red in the 160 band, well, in uh, blue in the 125 band. So it's going to show as a J125 dropout. And those uh, horizontal lines are sensitivity limits for various surveys, surveys we have considered. The green line, the green dashed line, is whenever the difference in magnitude becomes larger than 1.2. So it's whenever you can have claim this dropout criteria, this is <coughs> the green line. As you can see, in this case, the red line, which is uh, the J band, the pairing magnitude, <coughs> is above sensitivity limits up to redshifts of around 12. So you can certainly detect this object, this million solar mass object as a J-band dropout with the most sensitive surveys here, which, has the, which are the HUDF surveys. Let's see, for uh, capture, the situation is a little bit more there. You can still detect it as a dropout, but only in the 
deepest of, of the three HUDF surveys, because for the other ones, as you can see, the sensitivity lines are above. Now, if you assume that you can even build more massive, that, that's a very that's a reason, unreasonable assumption. Basically, it's claiming that you're going to accrete all of the baryons into a dark star. Now, let's just assume what would happen, because in principle, it's cool enough, so accretion could, could happen if it's not disturbed by other phenomena such as mergers. If you assume this 10 million solar mass, yes, obviously, it's going to be observable as a dropout in all of your bands. So this is going to actually place very, very stringent constraints on, on the observability with JWST, because here we're talking about HST, Hubble, which is an instrument that already should have observed them if they were existing. Same for the 10 million with capture. They should have been observed. Now, in order to place uh, constraints, we, we need to estimate how many such objects are observable. N is the number of such dark stars in a field of view, which spans theta squared arc means. You need to know the formation rate of um, dark, matter, dark matter halos that are potential hosts per unit redshift, per unit arc mean. Then you need to know what's the fraction of those uh, dark matter halo that could host a uh, dark star, what fraction of them actually host a dark star. So this, this is a fudge factor quantifying that unknown. Then theta is your survey angular uh, size. And then those two other parameters basically quantify the, the fact that we don't know how many of the dark stars survive from the moment they were formed till the moment they could be observed. So let's say it's formed at 15. It can be observed with, SA, uh, with uh, Hubble at 10. How many of them survive up to that point? You know? And then also this guy right here asked or the question, well, it entered the window of redshift one observability as a dropout because if you use dropout it's not certain a redshift is not certain you can use a dropout and claim detection in this case between 9.5 and 10.5 so you don't really know where that object is so this uh, factor here quantifies the probability that the object enters the, this redshift but dies somewhere in between so it's not going to survive throughout the observability window with, with all of those, you can actually compute the number of observable dark stars. And uh, let's go back here. In order to get this, this uh, rate, formation rate per unit redshift, per unit arc mean, you actually need to know something about the formation of dark matter halos. So this comes from simulations, and body simulations. This is data, data from uh, simulations by Ilya and Ilyev and Paul Shapiro which they kindly provided to us. Formation rate of halos of 2 times 10 to the 7, 1 times 10 to the 7 dark matter halos. So those would be a candidate for a supermassive dark star of a million solar masses. And if you want to go to the other case of 10 million, you need a formation rate of halos of 2 times 10 to the 8, 1 times 10 to the 8 uh, solar masses dark, dark matter halos. In, in blue, it, uh, you have a smooth average of the da data. No, in, in red, you have a smooth average of the actual simulation data. Once you have the formation rate here, dn, dt, number of um, halo per time, then you can compute this right here. The vol, vc is just the commoving volume. You notice plus minus 05 because we have a window of one in the, or an uncertainty of one in redshift, so you have to account for this. C is just conversion factor from uh, angular scales, like if you're, you're working on arc means or whatever to stair radians. And this T is the cosmic time between the uh, Z start plus 05 and Z start minus 05. Z start is just the redshift at which formation at a supermassive dark star started. When it, when it ended, it depends on the accretion rate, because you want to start with this small object of about 10 solar masses and end up with an object of 10 to the 6 solar masses. So based on how much mass it accreted and the accretion rate, you can know when, uh, when the event ended. So I'm going to show here three different cases. If it forms a 10, for the case, um, it must have started at 10.7 for a 1 million solar mass. 
<coughs> okay, if, if you want to go to a 10 years or mass, it must have started later. Why? Just because you have to have enough time to accrete way more material. So that's the difference between 13 and 10.7. And uh, why is this relevant? Because from this start, you're going to actually take your DNDT and plug it back here to get your number of halo per uh, unit redshift per unit angle. Okay? So now in case B, let's assume they form a Z12. That's going to be uh, for, uh, starting at 12.8 or 16 for the different cases. And let's now assume they form at 15, then they have to have started at 16 or roughly 20. Now, this is just the formula telling you how to compute the cosmic time in terms of your cosmological parameters, omega lambda and omega matter, because you assume just the matter dominated universe. With all of this, we went ahead and placed constraints on this fraction of uh, dark matter halos that can host our supermassive dark stars. Right? So on this plot, <coughs> this is what you're going to see. Constraints on the fraction of dark matter halos that can host such an object. And on the x-axis is the log of the product of the other two fudge factors, which were f of delta t. And the f it surv uh, that survives. So how many of them survive from formation to observation, and how many are, are surviving from the moment they enter the observational window till this ends. And as you notice, Assuming the most favorable scenario, you have a about, which is here, about 10 to the minus 3. So even in, in the most favorable scenario, HST is telling us that only one in a thousand dark matter halos for this situation are capable of hosting a dust dark star. If there were more, then HST, HST should have definitely seen them. All right? Now you go to the 10 million solar masses, and obviously the bounds are going to be uh, different. And in the most favorable scenario, you have 10 to the minus 1 or something like that. The reason the difference uh, comes from the fact that the formation rate of those halos is way different than the formation rate of those halos. So that's going to be transparent in the difference in the uh, constraints on the fraction of dark matter halos. Now, once we learned that HST should have been able to observe dark stars, but it didn't, so the lesson we learned are to place bounds on the fraction of dark matter halos that could be potential hosts for them. Let's see what we hope to see with its successor, with James Webb the Space Telescope, which is going to be launched s relatively soon, right? Again. <laughs> I, I think they say 2018, but they, they also had a previous date, so I don't know. <laughs> 2018, let's just see, right? So for now, this case is a J-band dropout, Z10 detection. Obviously, what's going to happen is you're going to just replicate the bounds or the null detection from HST. So you should not expect to see them as a J-band dropout just because they could have been observed with HST, which is what you see here. And less or equal than one, non-detection. Even if, in principle, each, individuals, each individual such object, as you can see, is detectable as a J-band dropout in the <coughs> near time 115J filter. With capture, again, they are barely detectable as a dropout for 10 to the 4 seconds exposure. For 10 to the 6 seconds, they are detectable as a dropout. However, the bound is going to be stringent as before, so they're going to be less than one. For the 10 million solar masses extended adiabatic con contraction, rip again, because HST has not seen them, JWST won't see them, but Z equal 10. And the same with capture, won't see them. Uh, we have assumed an uh, instrument field of view of this, so we, we just the results are, are going to scale with theta squared. If in the end you end up to have a multi-field survey, adding up those, you can boost it to larger than one. So what's the chance of getting 100 days of exposure time on a JST super deep field? Because that's 10 to 6 seconds. I didn't write the proposal yet for <laughs> this, so I don't know what the chance will be. But I guess like if... Uh, 
if the right people are known and then this is presented with solid arguments, they, they could be interested, you know. But uh, either way, you don't need to, I mean, they're gonna, e they're gonna have a deep field survey anyways, independent of this. And we can just look at their data and see, okay, there it is, you know. We don't need to have a dedicated, well, look for dark stars. They're gonna look for, for the first stars anyways, so. Uh, where were we? Okay, now the interesting case. Can you hope, to, so there's absolutely no, o almost no hope to detect them at redshift 10. Can you detect them at redshift 12? And the answer I'm gonna show you in a second is yes. So at redshift 10, they can be detectable even with a stringent band bounds from HST as H drop-off, H150 in this case. So again, the candidate 10, uh, a, a million solar mass formed with extended adiabatic contraction. As you can see, redshift around 11 starts to become a dropout, even for 10 to the four seconds exposure here. Now let's compute the numbers. So you, you take your limits from before and you, you have to do some assumptions. We're gonna say, what is this uh, F of delta T? If you just blindly apply the bounds you obtained from 10 to 12, you're gonna get this number, like <coughs> essentially non-detectable in a 9.6 day arc mean second for, for the 10 million, for the million solar mass, supermassive dark star with extended AC. However, if you start to have like a larger or a multi-field survey with, with an angular square of 150, then you're gonna have about 10 detected. But just blindly assuming that the, the same bounds on uh, hold in, it can, can be extrapolating, extrapolated from redshift 10 to 12 is not natural. Why? Because it's more likely to have uh, those objects form earlier, as shown before, and they won't survive until later because of processes such as merger, and mergers are actually going to disturb this environment. They have to form at the very center or the very high density location at the center of dark matter halos. Mergers can disrupt this. So that means the bounds you apply have to be relaxed a little bit. And we relax them in, with such a prescription. We took this fraction of the observational observa observable window of time to be 1.5 10 to the minus two at Z equal 10 and unity at 12. And if once you do this relaxation, you're gonna end up with about 50 in a field of view survey of 968 Arcman and a l very large amount if you have a 150 Arcman seconds survey. Let's go with the same case with capture. Now you need larger exposure time because uh, the guys with capture are more difficult to detect. However, for case one, which I presented already, there's still <coughs> about two. So better, see, notice, that's interesting. Those guys are easier to observe, more difficult to observe, however, you have a larger number. So I, I can leave you as a question for later. Why, why is that the case? Why you have a larger uh, number uh, in case one, where you just blindly apply the bounds from, from redshift 10. And in case two, when you relax, obviously those numbers are gonna be very, very high, hundreds of such objects. Now for the less realistic scenario, when you assume that basically all the baryons are accreted onto your object, 10 to the seven uh, solar masses. In case one for the extended AC, even with the multi-field survey slim cases, in case two, there's uh, smaller numbers. Again, the trend is the same. If it's more observable in HST, it's gonna, uh, those bounds are stringent, so it's gonna end up placing lower numbers here, just because the bounds work more stringent. And we go to the case with capture, numbers is it identical with the one from the adiabatic contraction case. Uh, we can move and ask the question, okay, how about Z15? So can we hope to even push this farther back with, with, uh, with JWST? And the answer is yes. They can be, even the million solar mass can be in principle detectable as a dropout for both 10 to the four and 10 to the six exposure. Case one, not so not so promising case when you relax the bounds from HST, relatively good, like you can have even in one field survey about five such objects. 
but redshift 15 now, remember? And uh, for the 10 million solar masses, because the bounds are so stringent already, there's very slim chance to detect them. So I don't know how I'm doing on time, but I'm gonna end with some conclusions and then time for yeah, questions. Okay, so uh, the lesson to, or the key points to remember from here is that we showed that there's an additional heat source that has to be considered whenever you talk about formation at first start. And this heat source is due to dark matter annihilations, and it can actually lead to the formation of a new object called dark star. We also showed that there's plausible mechanisms for this dark star to grow to a supermassive status. Right? And why is this interesting? Is because we have a puzzle regarding the supermassive black holes in the universe, right? So there are no established known progenitors. These objects could be progenitors of supermassive black holes because once they enter the main sequence, they're gonna quickly collapse to a black hole. Um, however, let's talk about their observability. They can be bright enough to be detectable at redshift at the order 20. The lower mass is more detectable as a dropout. Why? just because the bounds from HST are weaker. At 12, both the million and 10 million solar masses, supermassive black hole, have a significant chance of being detected as an H-band dropout with JWST. At 15, the larger ones are uh, already too constrained by HST, so we can't hope to detect them, but the million solar masses can still be detected as a K-band dropout. Now the question becomes, all right, Besides those kind of objects, what else do you expect to have there? Like, okay, this is a possibility, dark stars. But still, there's the possibility of having an actual pop three star. How are you going to be able to differentiate between those two competing objects at high redshifts in the universe? And we have done studies based on uh, photometric color card signatures, and we have shown that so pop three can be categorized in two classes. A and C depending on the nebular emission, and de depending on the amount of nebular emission. And for type A, it's dominated by nebular emission, and we're showing that their color are red in this magnitude uh, plot. And for part three, if you can use spectroscopy, you would find a steeper, or even from color plots, you can actually estimate the UV continuum slopes and it's steeper than, um, than in the case of the supermassive dark stars. So, so those are just two of the signatures, but there, there's other, right? Because you have, a, you have, this guy is dominated by nebular emissions, so you're gonna see the Balmer edge and so on and so forth, wh which are not transparent at all in the case of a supermassive dark star. So uh, with this, there's some often questions such as, we know from current experiments such as direct detection experiments or indirect detection experiments, that what used to be called the wind miracle nowadays becomes a little bit shaky or it's in a little bit of tension with experiments. So what is this picture going to be when we go beyond that, right? Is it going to change and how? That's one open question. Another one would be, can we have other observer signatures, right? So one possibility, because this object is so large and puffy, is to have oscillations, stable, oscillations on a given time scale, which in principle could be observed. So one needs to simulate this, this effect. Then maybe, can you place experimental constraints on dark stars, not only from direct observation with, uh, with HST, but rather from their impact on the reionization history in the universe? If so, let's, one question would be, what are those constraints? But I think the most interesting and challenging one of them all would be to actually do a proper simulation, Cosmo hydrodynamical simulation, of the formation of those objects and see them actually form the core and then evolve. Because right now we have postulated that this core forms based on the critical temperature plots I showed you and then evolve them using stellar evolution codes. But to actually convince people those objects exist, one should be able to resolve them in a simulation. So, with this, I want to end by thanking you again for your, your time and uh, patience with me today. And when I prepared the slides, uh, I was expecting based on forecast some snow here. And, uh, actually, this is a picture of your campus. 
pretty camp with, with a little bit of snow. But it just so happens that the forecast was wrong and I didn't bother changing the picture, so. <laughs> That's actually a very good question, which I didn't have time to, to talk about. So you have to assume that whatever products are, at least some of them get trapped or stuck inside that star and get thermalized, right? So and no matter what the details of the uh, dark matter particle is, like no matter what it is, in, in the end, through channels, they're going to end up being the lightest uh, particles in the standard model. So you can safely assume that one, roughly one third of them are going to be neutrinos. So those definitely are going to get out and you're going to have energy escape. But the other two thirds are going to be, let's say, positrons, electrons, photons. All of those can remain trapped and contribute to, to a heat source. So in our model, we just assume two thirds for the fraction of the, the products that get stuck in the, in the star. Yes. You might have said this, and I just missed it. But so, because of the added energy input from the dark matter annihilation, these dark stars would actually be would they be like the very very first stars formed in before the pop three stars, or would well, they form about the same time? They, they they would form about the same time. But for those guys to to f actually form, they require a little bit more fine tuned situation than the regular pop three stars because you you really have to have them at the center here. Otherwise, the density of dark matter is not high enough. Moreover, you have to have adiabatic con contraction be fit work. We have done, we have actually done some numerical simulations on that and shown that adiabatic contraction is efficient enough to boost the uh, density here. But the most critical point is that they have to form at the center. Also, you have to have no metals. So very cool metallicity clouds. Once you have uh, metallicity, then basically uh, cooling is too efficient for, for this to happen. Yeah, I'm having trouble mm -hmm. imagining, I guess, this mixture of dark matter with baryonic matter. OK. Uh, and, and so could, could you tell us a little bit more about that? Because like, I, I, I understand how baryonic matter cools. I right. understand how we measure temperatures of baryonic matter. Yeah, yeah. But I don't know anything about dark matter and how we, we think of its temperature and how it radiates or doesn't radiate. And um, so I, I can't get a picture in my mind of what one of these stars, okay, stars so looks like as a mixture of both dark matter and baryonic matter. So maybe I have kind of like a slide which is telling you how much dark matter is there. It's very little amount of dark matter. Let me, let me see. So the amount of dark matter in the star is roughly 1%. There's very little dark matter inside the star itself. How, however, it's enough to support this object because of annihilations. And how it gets there, either it's originally there because of this phenomenon of adiabatic contraction, or because of capture. That, and then, uh, essentially, it responds to the potential well of the baryons. That's all it does. There's no direct interaction between the baryons and dark matter. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they're weakly interacting particles, so there's no actually direct interaction between the two. And the dark matter didn't drive the initial collapse. It was the baryonic matter that drove the initial collapse of the star. The initial collapse was driven by gravity of the baryons, and uh, right, so that that's the main uh, main source for the gravity there. So eventually they start fusing helium, they start fusing... Oxygen. Like uh, in, the, in the very standard picture where we don't consider this... I don't know even why I have this picture, this ugly picture here, let me go back. In the very, very standard scenario where we do not consider this extended capture or extended adiabatic contraction, what happens, the star actually enters the main sequence and is going to be around a thousand solar masses where nuclear reactions take place, and those are the ones that drive the... So, so this 1% dark matter is just like a spark plug. It just kind of gets the thing going earlier 
But it, even with 1% dark matter, and even with no extent, so in the extended case, which is basically what I spoke to you about, the, the case where you can build objects at about a million solar masses, right. uh, they, they must live very long. Right? But even in the other case where you don't consider that, and then you're looking only at about a thousand solar masses, dark stars, they still live in that phase relatively long. Like, uh, I think I have on one slide, I don't remember where, how many years, but it is quite long. I, I remember having it. I don't remember off the top of my head, but I had it for sure at some point. Was it? Okay, something like that. So, yeah, there you go, long leaf. So, so this is just the, the, the standard picture. They're in that phase for a long time. So if you don't detect these things with James Webb, right. what is it due to our models well, of I dark mean, matter? Do these things have to exist, or is it that they might exist? In if, I, if I would see them in a cosmo hydrogen dynamical simulations, yes, I would say they have to exist. Right now, with the setup we have, I would say they're very plausible to exist. The conditions in the universe are as such that there's a strong likelihood for them to exist. So now, with JWST, I think the debate is JWST certainly is going to detect first stars because it was built for that. I mean, if it doesn't, then <laughs> the guys that you know were going to unfund it are going to be really. I, I'm not going to go there, but if it doesn't detect first stars, <laughs> they're old, they'll retire. Right. <laughs> so. There's going to be object <laughs> at redshift of plausibly 50 in JWST. So the big debate is going to be, well, what is this? This is the first galaxy. This is the first star. So photometry techniques are going to be really important. Thing. And I have like a few, I don't know if there's time, but I can kind of like show you the differences I mentioned a while back. So you, you, you're firm that we're going to see these things? Not these things, but we're going to see candidates. We'll for see something. And then we have to say, OK, because of uh, uh, Top three stars are expected to have nebular signatures, right? Do we see nebular? No nebular. Then it's very likely that we have this kind of object because there's no, no nebula around it. So but if, if it turns out that the dark matter particles are not the only antiparticles, then it's all from Yeah. I mean, it, it, it cannot annihilate into yeah, the heat source. Right. Yeah, right. and then also the cross-sectional of the interactions. Yes. We don't know that at all. Right. And now it becomes, so as I said, nowadays the, this so-called wind miracle is kind of uh, pushed into a very far corner of parameter space. It's still not, because remember, all I need to know is the ratio of, uh, what, sigma d over m, right? So even with current experiments, this ratio is still within the ranges we discussed here. So we're still fine. Well, we will see you all next semester, and uh, let's give cousins a moment.